I'm going to go ahead and get started with my introduction. Welcome, everybody, again. Uh, thank you all so much for tuning in with us this evening or afternoon. Um, this is Cross Pollinations, the Canadian Association for Health Humanities Virtual Rounds series. It's sponsored by the League of Canadian Poets, which is where I'm tuning in from. I'm the administrative director at the League of Canadian Poets. Um, and it's also sponsored by the Canadian Association for Health Humanities and the Health Arts Research Center. Um, these next couple slides are uh, what has been sent to me by our uh, health humanities partners. So I don't 100% know them, but I just read them and, I, and no one has complained to me yet. Um, so I'm here to disclose that we have no financial disclosure and no conflict of interest to disclose. I also uh, want to read our land acknowledgement. This is the land acknowledgement for the League of Canadian Poets. Um, I know that at this point we are all very familiar with land acknowledgements as a routine, um, but I still feel it's very important to read the land acknowledgement, no matter how familiar it may or may not be, um, because it is essential that we continue to that we continue to acknowledge the uh, ongoing harm that's being the ongoing harm that is faced by um, the Indigenous peoples on Turtle Island, uh, and these land acknowledgments are not enough, but they are still something that bring it to our attention uh, somewhat ceaselessly. So I encourage you to share your own land acknowledgement in the chat if you'd like to, um, or if you're not sure of the territories that you're situated on, maybe just do a quick Google. Um, I find that uh, universities tend to have really informative land acknowledgements. So if there's a university or college in your area, um, as well as you can share a link to an indigenous organization that's doing uh, work that you think is really neat or work in your area. Um, and I would love to see those in the chat. Right now, I will read the leagues. Uh, we would like to acknowledge that our organization is situated upon traditional territories, including the territories of the Wendat, the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Mississauga of the New Credit First Nations, and the Métis Nation. The treaty that was assigned for this particular set of lands is collectively referred to as the Toronto Purchase and applies to lands east of Brown's Line to Woodbine Avenue and north towards Newmarket. The League of Canadian Poets recognizes the enduring presence of Indigenous people on this land and also recognizes that art, poetry, and poetic practice related to the work of our organization takes place in traditional territories of many different nations. We encourage each attendee here today to learn more about the treaties and histories of Indigenous people tied to the lands where you live and work. And this slide is mitigating potential bias. Each presenter has been given instructions about the conflict of interest form prior to their proposed session date today. Included in this package are instructions on how to mitigate bias in their presentations. For instance, if there's any reference to specific medications in their presentations to use generic names. And through this process, we endeavor to prevent any perceived or real conflicts of interest. However, if any conflicts of interest become apparent during the session, please alert myself via chat and we will intervene. I'm also going to share a link where you can provide feedback about this session in the chat uh, during the session, uh, and then you'll also receive an email with this link afterwards. Uh, I am going to enable live transcription. I have, in fact, never used this before, um, so please uh, let me know if it is working. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen now. And I am going to spotlight our wonderful guests. We've got Amelia Nielsen here and um, add spotlight, there we go, and Taya Gabeza. And just before we get started, I am going to read their bios from our website. Uh, I'm going to check the chat really quickly um, just to see if I've missed anything. Okay, fantastic. 
So Amelia Nielsen is Assistant Professor of Arts, Medicine, and Healing in the Health and Society Program at York University. She is the author of a scholarly text, Disrupting Breast Cancer Narratives, Stories of Rage and Repair, and two collections of poetry. Bodywork was a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award, the League of Canadian Poets Pat Lowther Memorial Award, and took third place in the Fred Cogswell Award for Excellence in Poetry. Her first book of poetry, Serge Narrows, was a finalist for the Gerald Lampert Memorial Award. Taya Garbeza is a disabled and neurodivergent queer poet, writer, editor, and multimedia artist creating in Treaty 4 territory, Regina, Saskatchewan, on the homeland of the Métis Nation. Taya holds an MFA in writing from the University of Saskatchewan and an MA in English and Creative Writing from the University of Regina. In 2019, Taya's poetry won an honorable mention in the 2019 Short Grain Contest. Most recently, her scanograph, My Father Catches Me Confronting Memory, won an honorable mention in Room Magazine's 2021 Cover Art Contest, and she was a finalist for Palette Poetry's 2021 Emerging Poet Prize. Those are some stellar bios, and I cannot wait to hear this conversation tonight. So welcome, Amelia and Taya. Thanks so much, Nick. Um, from my end, the transcription isn't working, so I just want to double check before we get going um, if I can enable the live CC transcript. Unless if every if it's if you're able to see it, I'm not able to, but that might say more about my screen than the actual enabling of this. But it would be great if we could have that in chat just to make sure before we get going. I do see it working on my screen. Oh, awesome! Someone awesome! Did mention that it's working. Great. You great, may have great. to click the live transcript button at the bottom of the screen. Great. Yes, I use this in my classes all the time. I think I just haven't been on, on this end of um, things exactly. Thanks so much, Nick. And before I get going, I have read all the preliminary materials and I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, I also want to say it's nice to see so many familiar faces and names and um, on our participants list joining us tonight. I, I know what an incredibly busy time of year it is. So, so certainly thank you for joining us. So I met Taya quite recently when, um, when Jeanette Lyons reached out to say, would you be the external examiner for this fantastic thesis? And I said, yes, absolutely. And then she said, oh wait, do you want to know what it's about? And I was like, no, no, I'm, I'm good. You've already given me a sketch. I would love to meet this, this poet and, mm -hmm. and this crip thinker. Um, and so as is customary, we not only grilled Taya um, at her defense and she brilliantly defended, but, but more accurately shared her work. So when I got this invitation from Nick earlier this month to participate in this, this, this fantastic event, I said yes, and I, I would like to invite um, Taya, whose, whose manuscript is, is not in published form yet, but very much is looking for an audience and I think a publisher, and it's such a visual work doing such interesting things. In terms of how we were gonna try to figure out to be in conversation with each other, we are gonna go back and forth. Um, we decided on a sort of an experiment, um, which is that I was aware in Taya's artist statement that she had read um, my piece on dissonant disabilities, and I have been lucky enough to be asked to republish or reprint this essay a couple places. Um, firstly, this book that I want to sort of amplify right now, which is the work of the editor Diane Drieger, Still Living the Edges, a Disabled Women's Reader. Um, and, and parts of this um, are also forthcoming in um, a disabled poetry anthology in the future. So when I wrote this, I didn't really think I had much of, of an audience. Um, I, I didn't really know where my people were exactly in terms of trying to rethink the categories of disabled experience, including my own, and really trying to think about the connections between crip theory and crip poetry and, and poetics. So what Taya and I have decided to do is that I'm going to be reading um, just parts from this essay that was written, I guess, uh, six years ago now. And she's going to be showing and reading her much more recent um, manuscript because we thought we would place these texts that were written in different places, different times, different generations uh, perhaps, 
this kind of hybrid critical creative work to see the places where they might animate each other and be in conversation but also to, to sort of make apparent, I guess, the places that they disconnect and the places where there are still spaces, very much um, profound spaces between our experience. So with that experiment in mind, um, I am reading from work that you might be familiar with a couple of you. So I guess I won't apologize, except for this is not new work um, that I am presenting tonight. So I'm going to start with the first part of this essay and then Taya is going to share um, parts of her manuscript. There's a particular pleasure in rethinking categorical understandings of bodies and minds, whether it is in the mode of crip, queer, or feminist theorizing, and I, like others, suggest there's even greater satisfaction in inextricably connecting these perspectives. Of course, Alison Kafer's, Alison Kafer's book, feminist, queer, crip, suggests that while some may flinch at the harshness of the word crip, this desire to make people flinch, to wince, suggest an urge to shake things up, to jolt people out of their everyday understandings of bodies and minds, of normalcy and deviance. For me, Naming not only one's theoretical perspective, but also oneself as feminist, queer, crip, does not induce anything akin to a wince. Instead, it speaks to intimate connection, to bringing together what many of us love fiercely. Yet this desire to jolt people should remain a central concern of crip theorizing and activism, poetry and poetics, I would suggest as well. In fact, this desire to shake things up remains strong as I query commonplace understandings of the proper place of chronic illness within discussions of disability culture. The claiming of disability for those of us who identify as chronically ill remains a site of tension. In their introduction to, to another work, Michelle Owen and D Diane Drieger, in Dissonant Disabilities, Women with Chronic Illnesses Explore Their Lives, ask, quote, can women with chronic illnesses identify as people with disabilities all the time or only sometimes? This is a complex question because while chronic illnesses can be a source of disability for some, for others, it is unpredictably so. In fact, if I am not currently experiencing unmanageable symptoms, what is my relationship to chronic illness? What is my identity in relation to disability? As such, I seek to highlight how poetry provides a critical site to explore these questions through crip experience and embodiment. And in this hybrid creative critical piece, which is actually transformed into a much larger project for me on dissonant disabilities, I explore disability poetry and crit poetics by at least in part turning to my own poetry in bodywork. The genre of poetry illustrates why chronic illness is a dissonant disability by experimenting with innovative formal techniques on the page to explore what can be said and what is still left unsaid about the disabling effects of disease. What I wish to explore is engendered by fierce love and fueled by curiosity. I'm querying what the poetry and poetics of disability might offer as a way of writing, theorizing, and community making for those of us who identify as chronically ill, but also for those of us that don't identify as chronically ill. So I'll stop here and uh, pass the virtual baton to Taya. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amelia. I, I love that essay, so it's great to, to hear it, uh, hear you read it. Um, hi everyone, I'm Taya. Uh, and I've also read the materials that were given to us and I have no conflicts of interest. And I just wanted to say that I'm a settler in Treaty 4, the unceded territories of the Nehiwak, Anishinaabek, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota nations, and of course on the homeland of the Métis Nation. Um, so my manuscript 
as Amelia has graciously introduced, was my MFA thesis. Uh, it's entitled How I Bend Into More. Um, it's a book length long poem uh, that's multimodal. And by this, I mean that the manuscript incorporates visual poetry that is composed of scanner photographs, um, which you will get to see uh, throughout tonight. So I have a, a PowerPoint presentation that uh, has screenshots of the poems that I'm reading um, and the visual pieces as well. Um, so what the manuscript kind of does, just to introduce it a little bit, it's centered in my disabled experience um, and explores the intersections of the disabled body and poetic form um, and sort of roots itself in experiential knowledge uh, and embodiment. So basically the poem attempts to perform embodiment as the speaker sort of undergoes a journey of repair from ableism and self-inflicted pain. Um, and in it's sort of, an, it's a long poem articulation of a restoration of the self um, and the body writing itself into selfhood. Um, so I guess I also just wanted to note before I get into reading um, the beginning of the poem for you is that uh, throughout the presentation, there's going to be images on the PowerPoint that are screenshots from the manuscript itself uh, for accessibility and also for all of you to see how the poem is formatted on the page because that's quite important to the work. Um, and then you'll also see the scan scanner photographs, uh, which are pretty easy to tell apart from the screenshots, but sometimes um, some of the images uh, do fool you into thinking it's like really all right on the page. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that and that uh, I've also typed up some image descriptions in case anyone needs them. And Nick will graciously post those in the chat as I turn slides. Just gonna share my screen. <clears throat> a cut line, a fold line, a stitching, a thread, a surgical trace line, a suture, a scar, a spine. Twelve a.m. on the ninth anniversary of my spinal fusion. Naked on my bed, my whole body bent, scalene. In my 45 degrees, measure my dark room, eyes closed, my fingertips, my mirrors, trace the crescent, overlap of skin over skin, an unsolved space. Oh, there we go. Curled from knees to child pose, I lengthen to learn the parentheticals of curves. My body's rotational dynamics, another language, wanting to be opened, to belong to me. I make a pact, use touch for answers, feel how soft skin is, even calloused patches shimmer our stars flaking into air. How have I not noticed this before? My own quilled shape, a half moon. My coiled fingertips stroke, papery edges, toes swollen berries. At my own pace, build a circuitry for repair, for what my body remembers. How do I grasp? my uneven pressures, what my body has tried to tell me. So that's the beginning of the poem. Um, and you'll get to see more in, a, uh, after, in my second set, I guess. Um, and what I wanted to just explain before you get to see more of my work is 
um, a couple of things. So as you heard, there's a mention of a uh, paper quilt. So paper quilling is the art of rolling and uh, folding paper strips. So you roll and pinch them into shapes, which then you can um, build on to make a larger shape. And you'll see an example of that uh, in my next uh, sharing. And I also wanted to talk about uh, one of the various shapes the poem represents. So as you saw, there, the introduction poem, or I guess piece of the long poem, um, it has that centered line that's composed of hyphens, uh, vertical on the page. So in conversation about embodiment and experiential knowledge, uh, this dotted line or vertical line um, permeates throughout the manuscript in a lot of different ways. It's one of the most prevalent shapes. And among the multiple motifs that the poem outright states, uh, the dotted line also represents the shape that doctors and surgeons sort of desired to fix my spine into, um, into sort of a, a straight normative spine, um, one that was devoid of curve. So what this desire stemmed from um, for me and in doing my research uh, was from the medical model view of disability. Um, as Eli Clare notes in Resisting Easy Answers, the medical model of disability defines disability as a medical problem located in individual bodies and frames those problems as curable, or at least treatable, by the medical industrial complex, in essence, giving doctors complete authority over the embodied experiences of disabled people. So I required a spinal fusion because my curvature was so severe that my spine was beginning to reshape my rib cage, which started a process whereby my lungs and heart were being crushed. While the fusion saved my life, um, the surgeon couldn't fully straighten my spine, leaving me with a 45 degree of curvature. So therefore not fully so-called cured. So what I was attempting to do with this um, hyphenated centered line was by structuring the lines of the the poetic line around the vertical line, I attempted to write over the ableist imposition and expectation that my spinal fusion was a cure for my scoliosis and scoliosis related disabilities. Instead, the poetic line sinuously wraps around the vertical line and in turn curves it. Um, so, so there's this sort of blurring and twisting of this vertical line that, that reiterates a breakage from um, normative structures that reflect this sort of medical model of disability, it, disability's aim in order to contort the body to, to sort of fit the norm. Um, so essentially my long poem in all its formal qualities is inherently linked to me and my physical form. So therefore I'm sort of reframing and representing my body away from um, some of the more uh, harmful medical images and, and perceptions of it, and in turn sort of relying on my CRIP experience and from that experience, this experiential knowledge that might add to, you know, some nuances to these um, stories. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Amelia. <laughs> Thanks, Tay. I didn't even realize I muted myself. I'm only, you know, getting used to this <laughs> after nearly two years. So speaking to these, these ruptures, these opportunities repair, for repair, the distance, the dissonances, the imperfect cures, the resisting of cure. Partly this is what motivated my thinking around dissonant disabilities, which I wish I came up with, but that is, that's Michelle and Diane again, and Rieger and Owen. So, but I want to establish why chronic illnesses can be understood as dissonant disabilities. What I understand is both, both a theoretically rich description and a generative point of departure to explore the poetry and poetics of disability. When I first found Diane Drieger and Michelle Owen's anthology, Dis Disabilities, I had been diagnosed with an autoimmune disease and seriously ill for at least a year. 
In that first year of being out and well, a time where the search for a tolerable biomedical treatment plan to serve symptom management seemed elusive, I struggled. In that first year, I believed spontaneous remission to be the only thing that would make my life feel quote unquote normal again. Then I understood illness as something of a personal failure. It felt like the sum total of the worst things I could imagine. And I feel intense discomfort now in revealing my thinking back then. Although I no longer understand illness to be the worst thing to have ever happened to me, I would never say illness is a gift. For me, that phrase is too trite to grant in the respect of intellectual consideration. For the phrase illness is a gift to be a true one, personally, I would have to accept all that illness brought in its wake as a kind of gift. And thus, these gifts would have to include the gift of hands shaking so badly it renders holding a cup or pen unpredictable, the gift of muscle weakness that made a short walk nearly impossible. And then there are the gifts of relationship dysfunction accompanying support system loss and financial uncertainty. I'll save you the details on the gift of lack of bowel control. I never did achieve that mythic spontaneous remission I had read so much about and hoped for back then. So that is not what remade my life and it's certainly not what enriched it. In those first few years of living with autoimmune disease, I first refused and then reluctantly came to terms with the fact that illness for me was not only too often distressing, it was also too often distinctly disabling. My new role of patient was profoundly uncomfortable, especially as I had constructed a rather narrow identity complicit in tacitly espousing compulsory able-bodiedness, in Robert McCrewer's words. In living with chronic illness, I came to understand my own dialogue of self-worth, my own self-conception was unwittingly ableist. But I do not believe such a disproportionate investment in able-bodiedness is an inevitability of living much of one's life as normatively able, non-disabled. In fact, we have a collective responsibility to refuse compulsory able-bodiedness, and I am buoyed by witnessing instances of resistance. But the reality of chronic illness is that it is disruptive and too often persistently so. It defies traditional biomedical understandings of disease because chronic illness, in Moss and Dick's words, is about being both sick and healthy at the same time. Such a reconceptualization suggests that the protracted, pro, protracted nature of chronic illness, the chronic part, must be examined in relation to dominant discourses that continue to as, understand disease most often as acute, but not ongoing. Given that I was living in dissonance, simultaneously well and unwell, I had a new aware, awareness I had much to unlearn about disease, as much as I had to rethink illness and disability that were now an ongoing part of my life. Increasingly, what I desired was not the rejection of disability, but the embrace of critical disability studies as a guide to living, theorizing, and writing in my newly discordant body. Next, I wanted to find the academic literature that might theorize chronic illness from disability studies frameworks, and if I couldn't find that scholarship, then I wanted to write it. If crip theory can bring together concepts such as compulsory able-bodiedness, Robert McCrewer, and compulsory heterosexuality, the late great Adrian Rich, together, I was seeking to understand not only what this might say about my own identity, but also what it might say about how to understand chronic illness through such a means of theorizing. When I had first needed it, Queer theory had provided me with a useful frame to understand my experience of desire and gender and community and a whole bunch of other things. And thus to disable categorical notions of heterosexual or homosexual. And I have long understood queer to function as so much more than a synonym for lesbian or gay. And the subversive potential of queering sexuality and gender and community remains. Eve Sedgwick's assertion back in 1993 of, quote, 
what it takes, all it takes to make the description queer a true one is the impulsion to use it in the first person. With this knowledge, why was claiming crip proving so difficult? I began to understand then that it was much more complicated than a diagnosis of chronic illness might suggest. At that time, during active autoimmune disease, the first bout, I think, unlike many people with disabilities, I was sick and I was unsure if I would ever be well again. I lived with enormous uncertainty where the future was concerned. In those early years of truly struggling, ironically, others did not recognize me as, as ill, and certainly I was not understood to be a person with a disability. Because my illness was seemingly invisible, although I experienced both physical and cognitive impairments, I felt written out of disability culture because I didn't see my experience reflected in the images and words with which I was engaging. When I happened upon the term dissident disabilities to describe chronic illnesses, like Drieger and Owen, I became further convinced that chronic illness requires study, not only from disability studies frameworks, but demands articulations of the lived experience of ongoing pain and fatigue, to name two realities. Often this research and writing takes place in the context of being rendered invisible as a person with a disability. Overwhelmingly, I also came to understand that the best people to do this scholarship are those living with chronic illnesses, not because other researchers are unable to uncover the realities of dissonant disabilities, but because I came to value reading work that was as disruptive, unpredictable, and unruly as the bodies and minds from which the work emerged. I am reminded now, as I was stunned to learn back then, how little writing about women with chronic illnesses exists within the academic literature. Importantly, Pamela Moss and Isabel Dick's 2002 text, 2002, yeah, way back then, okay. Women, body, illness, space and identity in the everyday lives of women with chronic illness makes a substantial contribution to the discourse. There, they propose a, quote, ratty, radical body politics to better understand how women with chronic illnesses negotiate identity formation and daily spaces in everyday life. This theorizing emerged out of Moss and Dick's qualitative study where they sought to re-embody spatially, materially, discursively, politically, chronically ill women as, quote, ill bodies in a healthy society. But I want to suggest that any radical body politic of chronic illness demands an examination of how gender, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and age influence the diagnosis and treatment of disease, hence the difficulty at times of living with complex diagnoses. More importantly, this frame of radical body politics illuminates how biomedical definitions of chronic illness do not give adequate voice to the intensity of living with an unrelenting state of bodily uncertainty, now the, nor how this affects identity formation. Here then is where I see the role of poetry because as a genre, it provides a space for the deeply subjective articulation of experiential knowledge. Poetry, too, is radical in that it often defies the very genre that is, supposed to, that is supposed to lend it definitional stability. So this seems like a good place to, to pass it on to Taya, where we get to actually see this destabilization of genre on the page with Taya's quite inventive um, forms that she has created and used in her manuscript. Thank you so much, Amelia. That's so kind. Um, yeah, so next I'm going to share um, the section of the long poem. That's my surgery section. Um, and, then, and then I'll share about three pages, 30 pages in uh, after those, that section. Um, so here you'll see the scanner photographs of the paper quilling and sort of paper um, art. And, and 
I will share my screen again and we'll begin. <laughs> Steps for making a paper rose or spinal fusion. Tear a page from mom's memory. Cut halves, valley fold. Rotate body 40 degrees. Fold, rotate. Cocoon the spine. Form right angle triangle. Puncture, tip. Flip triangle, open side facing left. Beginners, score a belly outline along bound side with bone folder. Cut along lines for petal shape. Open for blossom. I don't need to outline. This is my hundredth time making a paper rose. Muscle memory slices. The unopened petal resembles a hunchback. I wonder what I'll look like when opened. When opened, cut one vertebrae off. Five will be left. Remember to carve out a flap before snipping off excess. Take your bone folder and curl edges of the remaining bloom. Don't pull too hard or the paper will rip. Keep the fallen petals for the rose's core. To make the center arc, fold tips towards heart. Place inside another. Secure with two titanium rods to prevent losing one in a breeze. Prevent losing control, secure under paper flesh. To scroll center C, grip bamboo dowel, hard between paper, thumb, and index. Move inward, a small blossom, stacks well with others. In paused space between letters is another I, looped, looped. My chrysalis cracks. My chrysalis cracks. Sometimes when curling mid blossom, petal rips, complicates the rest of the procedure. 16 hours in surgery, surgeon appears, tells my parents, there has been a complication with Taya's surgery lost spinal cord signal. If you believe in God, pray she wakes up. Dragi Bože, pomozioi, ona to nije zaslužila. All beeping machines in the hospital, a collective beating heart. I told her everything would be okay. Daddy promised. Code blue, stills my chest. Defibrillation pulses to restore my heart. Electric signals, prism. Lead me. to awakened static. Between my revival and stillness. My recession, oops, skipped one. My when hands insist, my resuscitation, when Excess refuses solution. Oops. 
Hmm. When translation traces a flat line, I dream a yellow dress's lace sweeps linoleum. Code blue beats. If you believe in God, pray she wakes up. I didn't see God. I spun in yellow, dress, endless circles, sewn bodily memory, cut up poems. Air carries pain, wake pushing pain chest, alive. Somewhere, my father breathes. I'm so sorry, my girl, somewhere. Oops. Curled body pedal, rips, wakes. So now I'm going to be jumping forward about 20 or 30 pages uh, just to show you a few more things and then I'll be done. Sorry for my PowerPoint, it seems to be freezing to skip ahead. So that's why it's been a little bit weird. Okay. Become attuned to my inner woven wave. Lengthen language, the parenthetical of curves. S on every surface. Parallel. Our scar offers me this beginning. Us without S. No. I want this. So that is my poem and uh, paper quilling. Uh, this is my paper quilled spine. Um, and I guess I can just talk a bit about my skinography, uh, but I'll stop sharing my screen so we can. Okay, great. Thanks for listening and, and viewing. And, and thank you, Nick, for putting the uh, image descriptions in the chat. I really appreciate that. Uh, so, so lots to touch on um, in, in this sort of section that I've shared, uh, but I think something that I'd like to uh, touch on that people might be curious about is the paper quilling and skinography. Um, so skinography is scanner photography. So basically what that is, is a process of capturing images using a flatbed scanner. Um, so items like paper quilled shapes um, are placed onto that uh, scanner bed or glass platen, and then the image is made from that item. Uh, so in, in doing this, scanography in its definition and in its practice seemed really technical to me, almost medical. Um, and so while I was making these images, I felt that I was giving myself an x-ray. Um, <laughs> so the use of the technology, in this case, the scanner, uh, was a way into the interior of my spine that I had never had the chance to experience before. Uh, so inspiration for this, um, visual artist Laura Ferguson, who has a series of drawings of her own scoliotic body called Visible Skeleton, uh, which I definitely encourage folks to go and view. It's an incredible series. Um, she notes on her website under the section, the story of the art, that she felt the X, that her x-rays of her scoliosis spine um, felt that they belonged more to the doctors than to her. And, and this resonated with me. Um, so, so for this reason, this, the skinography 
visual poems acted as a sort of reclamation and restoration of my body and the image of my body and its spine um, from, you know, the doctors and surgeons of my past and sort of belonged to me. Um, and so the last image that I showed you is, is my paper quilled uh, scoliosis spine, uh, which was an experiment because I wasn't sure how it would um, turn out. I was just like, okay, let's like try it. Um, and it turned out uh, much better than I ever could have imagined. So in, in making the spine, I used uh, what's called S scrolls and C scrolls. So I'll just share my screen again, just to show you the spine. Um, so what I mean by S scrolls and C scrolls, so if you can see here where my mouse is, that's a C scroll shape. And then beside it is, a, is, is an S scroll shape. Um, so I, I did this uh, because um, the S scrolls and C scrolls mirrored the terminology used to describe different scoliosis curvatures. So scoliosis curvatures are commonly known through their letter shapes. So S-shaped curve when there's a double curvature in the spine or C-shaped when the curve is only on one side of the spine, usually to the right. Um, and, and then I incorporated my surgery and scar by making the paper quilled spines length, the length of my scar. Um, so a, a lot of uh, things are connecting uh, there. Um, and so, yeah, so I had a, a lot of fun and a lot of um, really, there was something so deeply intimate about envisioning this paper as like, a way into the body that I, I never had before. And it was really, it was really something, um, the process of it was really important. Um, so I hope now to turn it over again to Amelia and hopefully you'll have a poem or two to share. Thanks, Tia. I know it's really important that we, um, I probably spoke a little over. So I, I'm, I think that I probably, I think it's important that we have questions now. Is that right, Nick? I know it should be at least um, 10 minutes or a little bit longer. If there happened to be time, I, I would. But thanks so much, Tia. And, um, you know, when we were in Tia's defense at one point, um, I think we both just started laughing. <laughs> Probably. And it was like, you know what, like talk about talking about disabled experience and disability experience, there's could be so much joy and love and connection. And that's when we started having a really good time, as I remembered in your defense was actually around joy, not because anyone was expecting us to be joyful or any of that toxic positivity baloney, but because of this <laughs> like intimacy mm -hmm. and digging in deep and giving ourselves permission to go the places that we wanted to go, you know, separately in our different projects, but then, you know, sort of finding these places where they kind of strangely fit together was, mm -hmm. was a lot of fun. So um, I'm not sure if Nick moderates the, the questions or if um, instead maybe people ask by chat or turn on their audio. Certainly I'd encourage you to ask Taya about her manuscript because the one thing that we don't get to see right now um, is how tactile it is. It's a very tactile work as paper quilling is. And that's just one thing that's kind of missed in this sort of flat register, but maybe there's a future for an installation, as I always seem to um, suggest when I talk to Taya about some, a place where the tactility of this work can actually be experienced in a, in a kind of relaxed environment. I'll have to figure out how that would happen exactly, but but I like challenges as well. It would be great. <laughs> as, as Taya does too, likes challenges as well. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I haven't seen any questions in the chat yet, but I encourage Anyone who has a question? Oh, here we go. A question Great. from Carla Harris. Taya, I was particularly struck by the part of this poem immediately after the code blue, when the body form came back. It was page 84. I was struck by the missing spacing between words, and I'm curious what that feeling was for you. Mm. Great question, Carla. Thank you. Yeah, so a part of it was um, inspiration from this book called uh, I have it here, just one second. I think it's called Silkworm. Yes. So it's called Silkworm by Jen Bourbon. And it's kind of, it talks about um, the life of a silkworm. 
And, and in this, Bourbon makes new words out of other words put together. And I thought that was absolutely fascinating. And it had such rich potential in, in sort of communicating um, the sort of uncommunicatable feelings and also disorient in this specific section um, that you ask about, I was trying to get it to, um, you know, uh, communicate the disorientation, um, the sort of inability to maybe, um, there was just a lot of pain, but it wasn't spaced out. It was all sort of together. And, and I kind of, I loved the, the poetic possibilities of sewn bodily memory as one word and what that might um, bring up. Uh, and, and then of course, um, in there too are the, the periods and, and something that I wasn't able to touch on today, but the, the long poem uses um, period as a sort of um, code as for pain in the manuscript. So it, it, uh, that punctuation turns up a lot and, so the way it's set up is sort of, you know, I'm, the spirit has survived, but there is still, you know, pain and disorientation. Um, thanks for asking. That was, that was a great question. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. That, that is a great question. And uh, those, you know, often in poetry, the absences or the white space or the kind of spaces are, should be doing a kind of work. And at times there can be a space for an inarticulation of experience as well as an articulation of experience, right? In that, in that space or intellect or whatever it is that the poem is doing to move things um, forward. <clears throat> I, I could read just one short poem as, uh, as people think of another uh, question. And this is from Body Work. So the draft before Body Work became a book um, with my friend Joe Roosh's painting on the front, which I love, especially if you can find the deer. Um, these are, the, the poems in here were originally some poems in the essay. So this would be dissonant, the dissonant disability um, piece. But I'll read the first poem um, where, like Taya, um, trying to reclaim biomedical knowledge and reframe it, um, trying to take parts of biomedical language or description and then kind of put a little bit of a, a spin on things through the experiential, but also through language play, like actually taking pleasure and joy in using language to do its own kind of work. I'll just quickly read this first poem because I, I do want to do a bit of questions. So symptomatic. This is a long poem. I'll read the first, the first symptom, I guess. Tremors. First morning thought atmospheric, unpredictable uproar external, jackhammer road work, too much caffeine, thought fault line, this quaking, geologic tumult, thought semi-trailer in traffic, thunder galvanic, weighted, felt chemical. I think we have a question on, on chat here. We do. Angus okay. Pratt is asking you, Amelia, um, mm -hmm. Professor Nielsen, can you expand on the phrase living in dissonance, illness, and wellness? Yes, and um, you know, I, I <clears throat> have Professor Nielsen on here just so no one confused me for a medical doctor, because I understand some of these exchanges have between been between medical doctors and, and poets, and I am I am not a medical doctor. Um, meaning Agnes, you could call me by my first name, it's just fine. Um, yeah, I mean, illness and wellness are a bit complicated in just in the sense that I think we've kind of lost a bit of our register to what even wellness is as we're inundated by wellness culture with its urging uh, that we buy things and participate in things. But I, I do know what you're getting at in terms of the dissonance, I think, of, of chronic illness, of being healthy and sick at the same time. And I, I think folks that have, you know, episodic disabilities probably have some perspective on that as well. When the nature of our impairments fluctuate and change over time, it doesn't quite make sense to use the language of disease all the time. It also doesn't actually accurately represent our experience to say we're unequivocally well or disease free. And so how do you articulate that, that, that dissonance, that living in uncertainty? 
for me, it's kind of, well, it's getting up and, you know, going through each day. So it's sort of commonplace and, and ordinary in certain ways. But I don't think it's ordinary at first. I think it's actually kind of flummoxing at first when you're grappling with um, a body that kind of tr makes trouble sometimes, or at least that's how you're experiencing the trouble, it's something that's different from the normal patterns you once experience. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I guess I could say more, more, I'm not quite sure um, that I have any kind of definitional stability, but I like the, I, I like the idea of living in dissonance. It feels true to me, living in dissonance. And so I think what I've tried to do is embrace that, but also realize this living in dissonance, I thought first started with the diagnosis of autoimmune disease, but I think my story goes much further back in terms of living a little aslant to so-called normal rhythms and so-called normative behavior, because I don't think I actually ever really experienced that. I always found myself a little on the outside of things, uh, perhaps for another conversation, but certainly as a kid that didn't fit in very well, um, that dissonance certainly sort, certainly was there a, a long time ago. And there's, so there's some reasons for it. And then there's just, you know, the kind of complexity and beautiful diversity that is human experience. I don't think many of us do normal very um, well, and that's great. I, I don't take a lot of pleasure in doing normal well. I love that so much. I have just shared the link to provide feedback on this event in the chat. Uh, we do have a couple more minutes if anyone has uh, any further questions. Um, Angus has uh, posted a follow-up. Do we have to use shock to convey that? Um, yeah. That's a good question. I, I don't know. What do you think? I, I don't aim to to shock, um, but certainly, you know, I, I I was reflecting on maybe maybe the word "crip" that that kind of idea of, of shock or wince. I mean, maybe I just don't quite get it, but I do understand that for some, the project of language re reclamation can sometimes be a bit troubling. And certainly in this anthology, um, Diane asked me if I would be willing to put a footnote with Crip and, and, and really acknowledge that that word does come from or has a relationship to the word cripple, to which we should bristle or look at the etymology, the lineage of exclusion and certainly of oppression. But like the word queer, crip has been positively reclaimed by communities um, and, and communities take a kind of pleasure, right, in that kind of contestatory bristliness of it. So, yeah, I, I don't think I, I, the shock part, I, I'm not quite, I'm not quite sure. Like, I would just maintain that I don't actually use language to shock, but maybe more to reflect reflect my own maybe dissonant experience. I'm not sure if you want to speak to that, Taya. I know we're rapidly and uh, running out of time. <laughs> I, I agree with what you've said. For me too, it's, it, I'm not deliberately trying to shock. I think, I think perhaps maybe the shock that, that someone feels maybe is something that, that they have to sort of can, you know, sit with for a little bit. And, and, and I think that, that's all I'll sort of add to that because um, <laughs> you put it so well. Um, well. I think that's a really that's a really good point though that you're making, right? It's it's the the speaker and the hearer, right? Mm -hmm. That's these are two as an asymmetrical relationship, but a relationship nonetheless. This feels to me like a beautiful place uh, for this to come to a close. Thank you both so much for joining us um, this evening or afternoon. Uh, this discussion was so rich and empowering and vulnerable, and I just am so grateful um, that I got to be a witness to it. Uh, the link for feedback, again, it has been shared in the chat. It will be sent out via email. Um, you'll also be able to view a recording of this, uh, the link of which you will get in the email as well. So thank you both, and thank you all so much for joining us, and I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of their day, however many hours that is. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all for being here. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Taya. <laughs>